I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the case Auer v. Robbins, a U.S. Supreme Court case for, from 1997. And this is really the origin of our deference and something we talk about a lot in administrative law. That's actually sort of a hot issue right now um, in the courts. And um, this is where we're going to go through the original case. Now, a quick word for my administrative law students. This case, Auer v. Robbins, is not one of the lead cases or primary cases in the casebook that I use for my course, but it's uh, talked about extensively in the notes uh, between the cases. And it's actually the subject of some of the cases that are in the casebook. Some of the, our cases are about our uh, deference and our V. Robbins. And so I thought it would be helpful to make a short video telling you what you really need to know about this case in order to understand the other cases that we're going to read and study. And also when we learn about the different types of judicial deference to agencies and agency interpretations, you know where this kind of fits into the um, puzzle or matrix of different levels of judicial deference. So let's look at what happened in our V. Robbins. This is a um, labor dispute, or at least it starts as a labor dispute between a group of St. Louis police officers and the Board of Police Commissioners. And the police officers were seeking payment of overtime pay, um, or kind of overtime pay in the form of back pay, that they said was owed to them under a statute called the Fair Labor Standards Act. And the commission contended, no, that the officers actually came within an important exemption provided by Section 213A1 of the Fair Labor Standards Act for bona fide executive, administrative, or professional employees. And therefore, they were ineligible for overtime pay. Now, if all of this is very confusing, I'm going to just tell you what you need to know about the Fair Labor Standards Act for purposes of this case, and I'm going to oversimplify a little bit. Um, it, generally, we have two classifications of employees. Um, <clears throat> if you are an employee, you are either paid by um, on an hourly basis or sort of an annual salary or a monthly salary. If you're a salaried employee, then it doesn't matter how many hours you work, your salary stays the same. If you punch in a time clock, punch in and punch out or turn in time sheets and you're only paid for the hours that you are actually at work, then there's a limit on how much, um, how many hours you can work, uh, being 40 hours a week. And over after that, the employer has to pay you time and a half or overtime pay. And so as you now think about who we're talking about here, this is, these are police officers who often have to work long shifts or get called in um, uh, for an emergency at night or on, have to work on the weekends and things like that. So police often work a lot of overtime. And if they were paid time and a half for those hours, it would really add up over the course of a year. Now let's talk about our statute in administrative law. We should always pause and take a look at the statute. The Fair Labor Stan Standards Act, as I said, exempts bona fide executive, administrative, or professional employees from overtime requirements. So if you're a salaried employee, this wouldn't apply to you. Well, what does that mean? Who, who fits in that category? The Secretary of Labor is, is charged by the statute with enforcing it. So the Secretary of Labor promulgated a regulation that's what we call a salary basis test for determining an employee's exempt status. And that's what I just explained in simplified form, that if you're paid something like an annual salary, like 50,000 or 100,000 a year, it doesn't matter if one week you work 50 or 60 or 70 hours in that week, your pay doesn't change. But if you're an hourly employee, not only do you have to pay, be paid for every hour you work, but once you're over 40 hours in one week, you're entitled to your usual hourly rate um, plus 50%. Now, the Department of Labor in cases had been interpreting this as this test as denying an employee salaried status um, and therefore the Department of Labor would grant the employee overtime pay when his compensation may as a practical matter be adjusted in ways inconsistent with the test. In other words, if your employer, let's say you says you have a salary, you make $50,000 a year, but then it's going to vary depending on your performance week to week or um, how much business you bring in or whether you meet certain um, performance goals or something like that. Uh, and, and your pay could be lower. 
then the Department of Labor basically had an exception to the exemption. That's what I'm going to call it. Um, and would say in that case, you're not really one of these executives or professionals, and therefore you would be entitled to overtime pay. And that's exactly what the police said was their situation. They said that their compensation, um, even though they were called professionals and they had an annual salary, that it, their pay could be docked for various disciplinary infractions, like poor quality or quantity of work. And so they could see pay reductions. And since they were subject to um, having their pay docked for um, uh, dis uh, disciplinary matters, they thought that they should get time and a half when they worked overtime. So let's move on. The court gives, in this opinion hour, uh, gives Chevron deference very quickly and in passing to the agency's regulation. Remember, Chevron is about an agency's interpretation of its enabling statute. And so the statute is the Fair Labor Standards Act, and the agency's interpretation of the act was the salary basis test, which had been promulgated as a regulation. No question about that. The court says that comes under Chevron. Then it moves on, and this is the part of the case that really matters, is it also gives deference to the Department of Labor's interpretation of its own regulation in the case. And they did this based on an old case from 1945 called Seminole Rock. Um, and in some of the old case decisions, this had been, uh, it was called that. After this case, the moniker really is our deference. You may see some courts referring to it as our dash Seminole Rock deference or something like that. But the most common uh, term for this is really after this 1997 case where the court made it very clear that this was a thing and clarified what the standard was. But I did want to mention that from the court's perspective, they had a long tradition of doing this. Uh, they didn't just make it up in this case, but they made it a lot clearer in this case. Here's a quote that I pulled out that I think is sort of the crux of the um, holding or the, the main opinion. Quote, because the salary basis test is a creature of the secretary's own regulations, his interpretation of it is, under our jurisprudence, controlling unless plainly erroneous or inconsistent with the regulation. Now, first, please note that Justice Scalia is writing this. He wrote that, that quote and wrote the majority opinion um, in this case. But years later, Justice Scalia regretted this. He thought that our had taken on a life of its own. And he actually called for the case to, his own case to be overruled uh, on many occasions. The other thing to keep in mind is that our deference is really a plainly erroneous standard, uh, at least as set forth in the original our uh, opinion. And that means that the, um, if the agency is interpreting its statute in a certain way, the unless it's plainly erroneous, the court is sort of bound to defer to the agency's interpretation. And as an aside, uh, let's talk just a little bit about theories of interpretation. If a court or a professor um, adopts a theory of interpretation based on the intent of the author, author's intent, and this is usually sort of a communication theory based idea that um, no one knows as well what words are supposed to mean as much as the whoever spoke them or wrote them. And so if you have an intent based sort of interpretive philosophy, then our makes a lot of sense, because the agency wrote the regulation, they, they're the author of the regulation, so no one knows what it means as well as they do. That's not the only way to interpret it, right? Because there's, when we talk about laws, laws have their life, a life of their own. They continue to have effect and be interpreted and applied by courts um, on an ongoing basis, even after the original people at the agency are gone, or maybe the administration has changed and so forth. But that's the idea here is our is partly based on giving a lot of uh, weight to the intention of the agency in terms of knowing the meaning of the uh, ambiguous terms. Now, if you've really been paying attention, you may be wondering, what is the Department of Labor even doing in this case? This is a private labor dispute between local cops and the local 
commissioners and the Department of Labor was not a party in the case. And the answer is the court actually solicited an um, amicus brief from the Department of Labor on this question. And this is an, um, a, a kind of quirky feature of our deference is that it really had its genesis with a request for a friend of the court brief, the, the court asking the agency what it thought on a case where the agency wasn't even a party. And some of the uh, um, subsequent cases kind of played out the same way where the court would solicit a brief, ask, ask solicit some, an amicus brief from the solicitor general or from the agency, uh, the secretary of an agency itself, and then just give heightened deference to their position. Now, Agencies after this started to routinely come into court claiming our deference uh, for their own regulations. Remember, this is a 1997 case. And in the early 2000s, agencies started to intervene in other cases where they weren't even parties, either through amicus briefs, solicited amicus briefs, or through unsolicited amicus briefs, trying to get the courts to follow the agency's interpretations. Several of these kind of big decisions were about federal regulations preempting state tort law. And the, on the court's part, the courts more increasingly treated ours the hour deference, which was originally a plainly erroneous standard, is more deferential than Chevron deference. It's sort of like a super deference, and the agencies would kind of always win. Um, and so as time went by, as the years go by, Justice Scalia and some really famous law professors claimed that this had uh, taken a bad turn and that this was a mistake, that our was giving agencies a perverse incentive to promulgate vague regulations that they could interpret however they wanted in each new situation. And so if you think about it, if you're at an agency and you know that as long as your statute's ambiguous, then the court has to defer to whatever your interpretation is, then maybe you'll have a perverse incentive to promulgate a, a regulation that's full of words like reasonable and substantial and material that ha are, ha have an open-ended meaning or are a little unclear so that on sort of a case-by-case -case basis, you can decide what it means and then tell the court that your meaning, your interpretation has to control. And that's a big part of Justice Scalia's argument against our deference in um, his later opinions. Now, in 2019, we had a big case in this area, Kaiser v. Wilkie. This is the, the most, at the time I'm recording, the most recent big Supreme Court case about this. And the parties actually asked the court to, um, to abolish uh, our deference altogether. And we'd had some new conservative justices appointed to the court in the intervening years. And um, so a lot of people actually, this was an anticipated decision and people thought that this was gonna be the end of our, of our deference. Well, that's not what happened. The court did split in the decision, but the majority opinion in Kaiser decided to keep um, our deference, but to impose limits on its applicability. So the limits after Kaiser v. Wilkie are only about whether it, our applies in a given case. And when it applies, the deference still functions the same as before. In other words, um, it's still a sort of a super deference. Now, the Kaiser opinion is notoriously confusing, the majority opinion, and it goes through <clears throat> five or six factors. It's a little unclear when the discussion shifts to a whole new factor, they don't number them. Um, and to apply it, what I have uh, termed our step zero. So this is an anticipatory step or an antecedent step. Before we apply our, we go through five, these five or six steps to decide if our even applies. And But if it does, then we still have our robust uh, type of our deference that we would. So it's not clear if it will apply, but when it does, it's, the courts are still supposed to defer to the agency's interpretation of its own regulations. And that concludes our video about our v. Robbins and our deference. Keep in mind, this our deference, just to recap, is about agency uh, courts deferring to an agency's interpretation of its own regulations. This is not about statutes. This is about a regulation that the agency has promulgated, which normally is actually interpreting a statute. And so then 
the regulation itself has to be applied in a case, and then the agency's interpretation of its own regulation will be controlling. 